Hey everyone, good to be here. Uh, let's just pray and uh, then we'll get started. Father, we, uh, we come before you um, uh, humbly just requesting, Father, that you uh, speak to our hearts today, um, allow us to have eyes to see and ears to hear, uh, that we may uh, catch a glimpse of your glory and understand uh, how that affects our lives and how we, bring, how we are brought into worship to you and service. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to spend this time around your word and just pray, Father, that your presence uh, would be honoured and uh, you would be glorified. Amen. All right, here we are talking about Acts uh, chapter 5. It's good to be here. Hey, everyone at home. Don't, uh, don't blame you for staying at home today on a miserable uh, Sunday morning. It's absolutely awful, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to talk about Acts today. And uh, uh, as, I, as I'm want, I, I wanted to give a little bit of introduction as to and give you some context around the book of Acts. Uh, and particularly as it leads into Acts chapter 5, which we're going to look at uh, this morning. Probably the two, one or two of uh, the most significant events of, of uh, the church uh, occur in Acts, right? And those two would be the ascension of Jesus uh, in uh, chapter 1 and, and the day of Pentecost. And so I just want to have spend a little bit of time talking about those and how they affect the whole of the book of Acts and then the apostles themselves and, and their reaction and transformation in their lives as they begin to understand the kingdom of God and how that is to be worked out. So let's jump into it. There's two perspectives I think you need to, we need to consider here when we're looking at, at the, uh, the book of Acts and that's the Gentile perspective but also the Jewish perspective. And so when we, as we look at Pentecost, and many of you would have seen this type of analysis of Pentecost before, so I won't spend too much time here, but I will point out some of the things uh, that are listed here. So Pentecost, as you know, 50 days after Passover, Passover when Jesus uh, was crucified, Pente being five, 50 days. So Pentecost has occurred 50 days after uh, Jesus was crucified. Pentecost is also the, uh, the festival of weeks, uh, or the Jews uh, celebrate it uh, as Shavuot, uh, which is a harvest festival. Uh, so it's, the, I believe, the end of the harvest festival for the Jews. And uh, it is also uh, celebrated as the time when the law was given. Because uh, the Jews had calculated that when they left Egypt uh, at Passover, remember that's where the first Passover was, it took them 10 days to get from Egypt to Mount Sinai and then Moses went up for 40 days on Mount Sinai and came down, that's 50 days until the law was given. So Pentecost or Shavuot was also the time in which the Jews celebrated the law being given. Now why is that significant? I think that's really significant when it comes to us discussing what's going on in the book of Acts. Because in the book of... Well, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Slow down, Paul. Okay, so some of the other things that happen in both of those periods of time, at the, at the giving of the law, we, Moses comes down from, uh, from Mount Sinai and the, the people are in disarray and he orders the, the slaughter of 3,000 Jews at that point in time. And here at Pentecost we have the, the harvest or the salvation or the repentance of 3,000 Jews. No coincidence, huh? One occurs, Pentecost occurs on Mount Zion and uh, the giving of the law occurs on Mount Sinai. The tabernacle is instituted at this point in time at Mount Sinai and, and God gives them the law about the tabernacle and how he was going to dwell with the nation of Israel. And here at Pentecost, God reinstitutes the tabernacle, except it's not a physical temple of God. It's now a spiritual temple of God where God indwells all believers through the Holy Spirit. In, 
both, both uh, events, we have the term glossa, glossa being translated tongues in, at Pentecost and glossa in the Greek, in this Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, glossa is used to translate the word thunder. And then we see fire on Mount, Mount Sinai. We see tongues of fire at Pentecost. And so there's no escaping in the mind of the Jewish reader that these two events are, are inseparably um, are linked together and God is doing something here. We saw last week Ananias and Sapphira were struck down by God just after Pentecost. We see uh, at Mount Sinai, uh, Nadab and Abihu were struck down by God in the temple and killed, consumed by fire. And both of those events are surrounded by signs and wonders, manna, water coming out of the rock, uh, the, the, the ten plagues in Egypt. And then you look at all the signs and wonders that occur in the book of Acts. And those signs and wonders were not to convince people about the reality of what uh, was going on, but rather God's confirmation that he was working through both Moses at that time and the apostles at this time. So there's an, there's an unquestionable link between what's going on at Pentecost and what's going on at Mount Sinai. At Pentecost, what we have is, or at Sinai, what we had was the giving of the law and the arise of the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And then at Pentecost, what we have is God coming and bringing the new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so this was an unmistakable uh, understanding in the Jewish mind of what was going on. First thing. The second event in Acts that is really, really significant is the ascension of Jesus. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at that as well. If you look at these two images that I've, I've got up on the screen here. On your left, uh, we've got the ascension of Julius Caesar. And on your right, you have the ascension of Jesus. Now, Julius Caesar, you may have heard about Julius Caesar and he was assassinated in ancient Rome, but you may not have heard that actually Julius Caesar ascended into heaven. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But both of these, these pictures, the, the one on the left, the one in, uh, that portrays Jesus, is actually found in the mausoleum of Julius Caesar, his family's uh, mausoleum, this iconography of Jesus. And the one on the right, the ascension of Julius Caesar, is actually found in the Vatican of all places. These, the, the iconography between the ascension of Jesus and the ascension of Julius Caesar are so similar. And that's the point of, of these two slides. But let's talk a little bit about that. When Julius Caesar uh, was emperor, he, he didn't have an heir, he didn't have a child. And so he adopted his nephew Octavius to be his heir. And as and prior to his death, Caesar willed his, the Caesarship, uh, the throne, to Octavius. So when Caesar is assassinated, uh, Julius Caesar is assassinated, there is a, a fight uh, over the throne, or over the, uh, the rule of uh, Rome at the time. That's a, a fight mainly between, or it ends up being, between Mark Anthony and uh, Octavius. Mark Anthony was the obvious choice because he was a, a, a great military man we all, and, and a great lover of women, as we know. And, uh, and uh, Octavius was a less experienced man, 
but politically savvy. And throw in the mix, you have the Senate as well, who, who are wanting to control Rome uh, rather than let, allow it to become uh, under the, the power of a dictator again, as Julius Caesar. Octavius eventually uh, wins. He defeats Cassius and Brutus and Mark Antony and, and wins uh, the throne. At the funeral games, so this is 44 BC, at the funeral games held in honour of Julius Caesar's uh, demise, a comet is seen in the sky and it lasts for seven days. Now, it's, it ha it, we have historical verification of it outside of Rome. It was seen in China as well and there are other records. But this comet lasted in the sky for seven days. After uh, Octavius takes the throne 20 years later, he points back and he says, that comet that appeared in the sky at my father's funeral was actually Julius Caesar ascending to the right hand of Zeus in heaven to become God. He declares this and says, and since Julius is God, I am the son of God and ought to be worshipped as such. And so the Senate, however, not wanting to give all the power to Octavius, quickly stand up and say, yes, we were there as well. We confirm exactly what Octavius is saying, but when Julius ascended, he told us that all power and authority is given to us and that we are his ambassadors to bring the kingdom of Rome to the world. Is this story starting to sound familiar? So Octavius takes the throne, becomes Caesar Augustus, perhaps one of the, the most famous uh, Caesars. The, Senate, the Senate's power is restored and emperor worship is, is enshrined in, in Roman culture. Now, why do I mention all this? I mention it because there's, there's so many similarities between the ascension of Julius Caesar and the ascension of Jesus. The ascension of Julius Caesar happens in 44 BC, well before Jesus, a long time before Jesus. So why is Jesus or, and, and or the writers of both the Gospels and Acts so obviously playing off this story of Julius Caesar's ascension. When we look at some of the, only some of the similarities between the two stories, the thing that really stands out for me is the differences in the power. You see that Jesus claims that all power is given to him, whereas the Senate and the senators say that all power is given to them. I think, or I suggest, not knowing the mind of God and why he, he did it this way, but I suggest that, that uh, perhaps God uses this to call out uh, the, the culture of the day which strove for power and um, immortality and the kingdom of men and saying that's not where life is found. Life is not found in seeking power for yourself but in submitting to the power and the authority of God, the creator of the universe. Secondly, I think perhaps Jesus uses this 
uh, story of uh, Julius Caesar's ascension because it is one that the whole ancient world was familiar with. Everyone knew this story. It was enshrined in, polit in Roman political, religious uh, society in every way. And everyone knew this story. And, Jesus, and in Jesus appropriating this story, I think, allows the Gentile community to, to at least begin to grasp the concepts of what Jesus is teaching and then able to understand the differences between the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Rome. And thirdly, and, and this is probably where I want to sit today and why I mention this, is because when we read the, about the ascension of Jesus in, in Acts chapter 1, in verse 3 it tells us that Jesus spends 40 days with the disciples prior to his ascension. 40 days uh, speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And I believe in that 40 days... Jesus is teaching them about what the kingdom is. And then he uses this example of his ascension, which is so completely contrasted against the kingdom of Rome. Jesus is, was telling his disciples that my kingdom is not like the kingdom of men. My kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom not based on swords and on power and on war and on tyranny and on betrayal, but a kingdom that is based on love and peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. It's a kingdom that is completely opposite. And I believe the disciples got this. If they didn't get it after 40 days with this, with the risen Jesus, I don't think they ever would have got it. But I believe they did get it. And we see that transformation in their lives as they go from the, after the ascension into the book of Acts. And that's what I want to look at next. They're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, as, as Mike pointed out last week. But they were certainly beginning to understand what their mission was, that they were the ambassadors of Jesus, the witnesses to his resurrection and his ascension, called to bring the kingdom of God to this world. So let's jump into the passage that we're looking at today, which is 517, and we're going to spend a little bit of time there looking at the transformation in the, in the apostles' lives. So in that story that um, we had read to us this morning, we see that the apostles, all the apostles are arrested and they're taken and they're jailed uh, by the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, they're put in prison and then we see that an angel comes at night and uh, releases them and, he, and that angel says to them, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Love that not the words of the kingdom, not the words of the gospel, not the words of whatever, the words of this life. It's great. I love that. But I won't spend time talking about that. I don't know about you, but if I've been locked up by the authorities and they've put me in jail and an angel comes and lets me out, I ain't going in public for a little while. I'm laying low. I'm going to maybe drive out in the country somewhere and stay away from everyone so I don't get locked up again, right? And that was the initial response by the, by the apostles when they faced persecution prior to the ascension of Jesus. We see in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, the apostles were behind closed doors being afraid, being in fear of the Jews. But this time, what happens? This time, when the angel comes and says, go out and, and uh, speak to the people in a public place, knowing very well that they're going to get arrested again, they go. They go out into the most public place, into the temple, and they start to preach the kingdom of God. So their fear 
had gone. Maybe their fear hadn't gone, but their fear was no longer c- c- controlling them. Uh, and they weren't, lis- they weren't uh, listening to their fear. They were obeying God. And, and when you look at the lives of the apostles, I just threw this in there just to remind us of, of what, how God transformed their lives. All these men had, were so confident in their mission and what God had given them to do as his apostles and his ambassadors to this world of the kingdom of God that they all were willing to lay down and did, in fact, lay down their lives for this mission. It's tremendously challenging, isn't it, for all of us. So they go out into the the temple early in the morning, the next morning after being released, and they start to preach again in the temple, knowing very well they're going to get arrested again. And, of course, they do. The, the, The temple guard comes down and, uh, and, uh, where are we up to? Sorry, just grab my notes. And says this, the captain of the, with the officers, went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So the the, the chief, um, uh, the captain, came down again to arrest them, but he, this time he's fearful of the people because the people are so supportive of, what's, of what the apostles are doing at this time. And if the apostles really wanted to, they could have whipped up that crowd into a frenzy and, the frenzy, and that uh, frenzy crowd may have uh, taken vengeance on, that, on the temple guard. But this time they don't do that, do they? What do they do? They submit to the authority of uh, the leaders of Jerusalem at that time. And if you contrast this to to Peter in the garden prior to to Jesus' dying, what does Peter do in the garden? He whips out the sword, doesn't he, when he was going to be arrested. Whips out the sword and goes to to cut off Malchus' head. And Malchus ducks and he takes off his ear. This time, however, that's not the reaction. They're under, beginning to understand that, we, that they are following a sovereign God whose power is such that all authorities and power of this world are in submission to him. They know that whatever, as long as they submit... God will come through for them. That their kingdom is not about taking up swords. It's not that bringing the kingdom of God is not about being, taking up force and fighting. It's about allowing God to do his work in and through them. So we see this transformation in the apostles. And then we, they stand before the chief priest and the chief priest says this to them. He says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And look at the response of the apostles. Peter, it's up there on the screen, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men or human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a cross. Now check out the next few verses. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. Their understanding the, the ascension of Jesus and the mission of, that Jesus had given them the, of bringing the kingdom of God was now part of who they were. They understood that Jesus had ascended to the right hand of God, that he had given them and entrusted them with the, uh, as witnesses and ambassadors for him in this world to bring the kingdom 
of God and their whole attitude had changed. And remember, this is the same high priest that only several weeks ago, Peter was standing in his courtyard and denies Jesus how many times? And only seven weeks later, he's standing there, in, not in the courtyard, he's in front of that high priest and his understanding and conviction to follow the, the uh, commission that Jesus has given them is driving uh, his behaviour. And you can see the transformation that has gone on in these people's lives. The contrast uh, between before uh, Jesus' ascension and after uh, his ascension in Pentecost is transformational. So how do they bring the kingdom of God? And what are some of the examples? Well, let's go back and have a look at 5, 12 to 16. And we can... Uh, read that or you can read that uh, as it's up on the screen but I wanted to bring a couple of things uh, to our attention in this passage first we get again the uh, the the concept of signs and wonders and we've talked about that uh, at the start the signs and wonders are not because the apostles are great uh, or because they're particularly holy or anything else except it is the sovereignty of God working to confirm uh, that these men were in fact doing what God was calling them to do. But I want to focus on, particularly on verse 15, which uh, I've got uh, underlined up there, and I'll read that for you. It says this, As a result... The people brought, brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so it lets at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Curious verse, right? Has that not always irked you? It's a curious verse. Was Peter's shadow magical? Did it, did it heal people when, when his shadow passed over them? It's a really curious verse and we don't see anything like it, I don't think, in the whole New Testament. So, so some scholars say, well, actually, this is not uh, literal. It, it's perhaps pointing back to another passage in the Old Testament, a kingdom passage, a passage about the kingdom of God. And so uh, I followed that and... And that passage is Isaiah 32, 1 to 4. And I want to spend the last couple of minutes as we close off this morning in this passage. And this is a kingdom passage. It's about how, um, uh, what happens when the Messiah brings the kingdom. Well, let's read that together. See, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, the str like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed and the ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. So who is the king in this passage? Thanks, Beth. Yes, Jesus is, is the king in this passage. That's right. It's a kingdom passage. Uh, it's talking about when Messiah is to come and Jesus is the king that will come. And so this is a passage about what the kingdom is going to be like when Jesus comes. And remember we talked about back in Acts chapter 1 uh, where Jesus had spent 40 days teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God. This is potentially one of the passages that Jesus took out and shared with his disciples and told them this is what the kingdom of God actually looks like. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But it's a good passage anyway. And we note here, and the reason that we came to this passage, was that we have a shadow 
in verse 2, shadow of a great rock. And we have a shadow in Acts chapter 5, the shadow of Peter and the shadow of a rock. Peter means Petros, which means rock. So we have the shadow of a rock in Acts and a shadow of a rock here. Now, maybe that's a stretch too far. I don't know. But that's how we ended up in this passage. Uh, what's more, really more uh, interesting to me is the content of this passage uh, for us to understand what the kingdom of God is. So let's look at that. So we, we've, we've worked out that the kingdom is Je the king is Jesus, right? So who are the rulers here? Come on, have a guess. There's no right or wrong answers. No? So the, who are the rulers? The rulers are us. The rulers are those who have been entrusted with the kingdom of God. The disciples, the, the apostles, those who follow Jesus are the rulers. Just in the same way that the apostles that were the ambassadors to bring the kingdom of God, so we are his ambassadors to bring the kingdom of God to this world. We are the rulers of this passage. So, if we are the rulers of this passage, what are the rulers like? Let's have a look at what the rulers are like. Because it's rulers, plural. It's not ruler, as in one, Jesus. It's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about us. So what are they like? Firstly, we see in verse 1 that the rulers will rule with justice. And the question for us as we start to look through this passage, how do we bring justice to this broken world? Good question, huh? In verse 2 it says, Each will be a shelter from the wind. How are we a shelter from the winds of this world to those in our community and our friends and our family that are around us? Each one is a refuge from the storm. How are we bringing refuges from life's struggles to those around us? They are like streams of water in the desert. How are we bringing living water and truth into people's lives? And finally... They are like a shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. How are we bringing shade and relief to people around us and in our community? I think the, the transformation that the apostles went through was they had begun to understand what bringing the kingdom of God to the nations was. It was about being, bringing justice, bringing shelter, bringing refuge, bringing streams of living water and bringing shade to the people around them. They understood that the kingdom of God was not bringing a kingdom of tyranny and power and of, of, of oppression, but bringing a kingdom of love and peace and joy. And this was the kingdom that they were beginning to unlock in their lives. And as we bring this kingdom into people's lives, verse 3 says, then, as we do these things, as we bring justice, shelter, refuge, water and shade, then the eyes of those will be opened. Then the ears will hear. Then the fearful heart will know then the stammering tongue will be fluent. It's only when we start to activate these things in our lives that the world will begin to listen. And we see that in Acts, don't we? We saw that when, when in the early church, in the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church had been transformed by this understanding of what, what bringing the kingdom of God to the community was about. 
And the community of God, oh, the community respected them because of that, because of the values that were so entrenched in, in the kingdom that they were bringing. It wasn't the signs, it wasn't the wonders that transformed the lives and the community around them. It was the genuine love and concern and the refuge and the peace and the shade that they were bringing to their community. It was their radical giving. It was their community engagement. It was their community support and their feeding of the poor and the widows. It was their submission to authority. It was their, their boldness uh, to, to share the gospel and to share the truth with those around them that was transformational in what they were doing in the, uh, in the early church. Can you imagine a community like that in West Pennant Hills that was committed to bringing a kingdom of God to our community, to bring justice and shelter and refuge and water and shade to our community? I wonder what that looks like for us. For my part, when, when we came, when Joe and I came to this church 25 years ago, um, we came uh, because we were burnt out in ministry and needed some love and care and respite and, and some, uh, um, uh, some time just to, to be healed. And that's what we found when we came to West Pennant Hills. Uh, we found that, that love and that support and that care and it was a place of healing for us. And my prayer for us as a community is this, that we will continue in that mission, that we will continue to bring the kingdom of God and to be that for our community, for each, to be that for each, toward each and every one of us but also to be that to the uh, other community outside, to bring the kingdom of God to our family and to our friends and to our neighbours. So let's pray together for that end. Father, as your ambassadors bringing your kingdom into this world, Lord, may we just bring justice, shelter, refuge, water and shade uh, to our community, to one another as we reach out in love and care um, to bring your love and care to those around us and to one another. Uh, continue to grow this place, uh, continue to use us as your people uh, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.